Hello and welcome to the 380th episode of the Crate and Crowbar, a podcast about PC gaming. We're recording this on the evening of the 10th of September. Uh, and by we, I mean me, and I'm Alex Wiltshire, and tonight I'm joined by Tom Senior. Hello again. Hello it's again. again. It's yeah, us it again. Like it's quite recently. <laughs> <laughs> time is now i mean it, it, popularly over the last year and a half um we've we should be coming out of the every day feeling the same but for me every day is feeling the same a little bit but that's because i've got a little puppy and i'm having to get up really early yeah that, that, <laughs> he that, does that the makes same sense. things every day yeah he's <laughs> he does his wheeze he does his poos he does his yeah. chews he <laughs> does his jumping up he does his che- oh, my arm i've got this horrible puncture wound on my right forearm. I've got a about a four inch scratch on the inside of that forearm. My left forearm is looking all right, actually. Just a few small scratches. Feeling a bit beaten up and left the for teeth, dead. Teeth are presumably still at that kind of weird needle stage the puppies have where <laughs> they're at the needle really stage. Draw blood. I think that he's also because you know he's been <laughs> he's been using them a hell of a lot. He likes to chew stones and stuff. And um, <laughs> what? I think it's time to get a few nicks and sort of chips in them, giving them an extra kind of. <laughs> your dog's your dog's playing life in hard mode. He's going around eating, he's a... eating rocks. That's a... <laughs> he's an absolute psycho. He's lovely. <laughs> he's, a, he's he's actually really lovely and very very sweet. And um, he just goes wild about twice a day. <laughs> and some, yeah, for some reason, they seem to be always there. <laughs> do you think where that you just uh, dogs do this? Where that sometimes just go absolutely buck wild for about 30 seconds and just run around in circles <laughs> uh at, at, like at maximum speed just incredibly fast to realize how quick they actually are as animals um and then they'll suddenly stop and sort of stare into space for a moment as though they've just like glitched <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> their circuitry is just kind of misfired for a for a minute i, I mean dogs. clearly clearly it's got something to do with the matrix like their oh yeah their, like, simulation their programming has gone a bit kind of gone a bit screwy the Matrix Four uh, was yeah. it's been revealed. We've all been was it red pilled? I forget which pill it is. I've got to say, like <laughs> uh, the way that the Matrix films have been co opted by uh, incels of the alt right has right. ruined the series for me. <laughs> I can't exactly get away from it. I, I can't yeah. get away from the imagery and um, <laughs> not associating with uh, people on the internet. Um, and that trailer is absolutely filled with going on about pills as well. And it's sort of, yeah, idea. yeah. It's, oh, pills no. <laughs> it's probably quite good film. So, yeah. <laughs> it looks quite fun. I noticed that Keanu Reeves is, is, is doing the, the face. <laughs> <laughs> His one face. Yeah. I love that face. It's great. <laughs> there was um, a period where like uh, all Keanu Reeves could do was look a bit confused um, and <laughs> that happened to be perfect for both Bill and Ted and Neo in the Matrix uh, so I think like he looked out he's kind of become quite a an eccentric figure now isn't he Keanu Reeves especially he's he turning over to cyberpunk and uh, he's, he's yeah I think I quite like him I think I think yeah my wife sort of said um, who's, who's kind of not in not been swept along with um, the Keanu Renaissance at all as marked by um, his appearance at that that cyberpunk um, sort of expo on the Sony stage or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. It was. She was, you know, that she's oblivious to all of that and probably isn't aware of all those Reddit posts where he's kind of given a hundred dollars to someone or given them a hamburger or talked <laughs> to them for half an hour at a bus stop, all that stuff and how wonderful he is. Um, she, she just remarked through it. I used to think he was a dick, but now I like him. So I'm looking forward to this film. And so, <laughs> That's what <laughs> Yeah, job done. He's been uh he's been rescued. He kind of reminds <laughs> me of Tom Hanks a bit, like uh Tom Hanks mega movie star very actually lovely in real life. And uh maybe yeah. I like the sports Aston Villa, which is you know and he collects typewriters. <laughs> yes, and he made a typewriter app as well, didn't he? And you did. But he apparently was wasn't very nice to uh some extra or someone. I mean no, it was like a, one of the actors I think on um oh, no. Band of Brothers and kind of destroyed their entire <laughs> he, he he said he didn't like their smile or something, and you know this they, that it was their big break, and oh, um, no. sent them off off set, and so they were just sort of oh, okay, and that was that big break gone. This person has since um done a podcast talking about I think basically what has happened in their life, you know, since this pivotal moment. <laughs> really, 
Oh no! Sounds grim. It's crushing. And Tom Hanks is going. Oh no! Please don't make. Please don't. I mean, I think about all the things I've done over my work life, and the thought of anyone making a podcast series based on something. <laughs> oh, God, <laughs> yeah, imagine me getting really annoyed with some like doing a kind of like a tetchy edit on someone's text, <laughs> sending them into a, a, a spiral of misfortune. Spiral. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Oh, oh. well. <laughs> I don't know how we got onto that, but uh, I don't know. Uh, especially because <laughs> there's actually loads of video game news around this week, so we can actually have more to talk about than usual uh, than we have in the past few months. The most important being Fat Thor for me. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so this is this is great. I think this is a, a good continuation of. Uh, so Boulder was in the first uh, God of War, and I really liked what they did with him because he was like super scrawny and just yeah. really weird and intense. Like he had this, this icy kind of stare that go like uh, was pretty much unforgettable, and he kind of was just a, a cocky thug. I thought it was just like such an interesting take on a god. Yeah, uh, and they resisted making him like super hench or making him kind of glow or you know making him look super saiyan. He just kind of looks like a dude who can move really fast, and yeah, it's it's just it's something quite unnerving about it. So I like the yeah, idea that's, that, that's the word, isn't it? He's really unnerving. Yeah, yeah, it's just like he's just not quite normal uh, in a way that actually th- that's a really nice way to realize a deity and um they've gone in a different direction with thor but i could kind of see similar logic behind it where it's just, it's just thor has been realized in popular culture so many different ways that having him uh giving him a mead belly <laughs> is is as probably as subversive a thing as you could do with him though actually i think uh in one of the avengers films uh, thor put on a, a lot of weight in, uh, in his despair at the start he does but it's treated as an aberration isn't it like it's a reflection it is, yeah, of kind yeah, of him getting a sort of a bit bit let down but in this you know he looks kind of like this is who i am but like it, it may totally makes sense for the stories because there are several stories about thor just eating a lot and oh winning, yeah winning as a result of just being really greedy <laughs> yeah and uh he gets into drinking contests with the giants the ice giants and all sorts that's of right, stuff yeah. like <laughs> he, he, that's one of these reasons i thought i think he was so popular as a folk tale is that he's, he's just a, a mad lad <laughs> who's always drunk <laughs> all the time and this and, is like yeah, yeah you know he's been the mad lad he's a bit older now and you know like he's got the body to uh to, to fit that yeah it's good it's good it's great it's good yeah i love it i love it very much looking forward to that game i had a great time with the first one um yeah that was a sony exclusive wasn't it so it's not pc but as we've learned anything could come to pc if uncharted 4 can come anything to pc there were so, rumors, uh, there have yeah, been rumors about god of yeah War, they have, and um, it, I mean, it would make sense, wouldn't it? Especially if you could sell the same game twice, because I would buy it again on PC, to be honest. I'm, I'm the problem. Yeah. <laughs> I'm part of the problem. And people getting grumpy about uh, companies just reselling the same game over and over again. Uh, I do <laughs> like, uh, I'm, the, I'm the guy. I'm the, I'm the reason why people do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, there was nothing particularly surprising about the trailer. Like, it was, because no. I did think that, you know, the, the, that, that God of War was so so beautifully made you know yeah you know just yeah. the quality just dripped off everything you know from the cat the sim you know the camera work through to the kind of the visual style through to the combat itself you know it is oh, that was so good the, the, beautifully, the move beautifully made the moves where um because you, you summon their axe back to your hand and there are moves where mm. you can catch it at the same time as launching a mega massive strike and it's so so good i did it yeah. like you, it's one of those uh, those amazing kind of bits of audio visual design that it's just satisfying to do a th- thousands of times i've built my entire combat strategy around that one move yeah. doing it over and over again it's brilliant to the end uh yeah. it's good very much looking forward to that uh, just a, yeah. a really really good third person hit things with a with an axe game <laughs> it's just really unapologetic about it um but with, and um good kind of you know dad anxiety yeah d- d- anxiety dad zianty <laughs> your new religion uh it's a uh, yeah just something quite straightforward about it so it's something a simple fantasy beautifully executed basically is, is just i admire that greatly yeah um, absolutely and speaking of beautiful third person games uh there was another one shown this week's Sony showcase again. It's, I think it's is, is it exclusive or is it exclusive at launch? That's a good like question. That? I don't know actually, but it's um, published uh, by Square Enix, isn't it? Yeah. So I, again, I'd expect to see that on PC. It's called Forspoken, uh, and I didn't know about this until Alex, uh, you pointed me towards the trailer just before we started recording, and um, 
I, I sat there going, oh, oh that's, <laughs> that looks really gorgeous. You went, oh, 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 oh. Then you saw uh, a, an odd looking cat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's come on, come on, the cat. So it's, it's, it starts and it's like, it's photo realistic and you're following the kind of hero of the story and she's, uh, just to kind of living life in, it looks like New York, something like that, modern city. And uh, she quickly gets sucked into a portal uh, and pulled into slightly, unfortunately, generic looking countryside fantasy world. But in between the bit where she's living a life and the portal bit, there is a, there's a weird, weird cat in there, Alex. <laughs> there's a very, I don't know, I don't know why they did that because like the human and the animation on the faces of the humans is incredible. But I, was, I don't know if this cat went to an intern or something <laughs> in the production yeah. process. Well, it's the very... fur was really good. You sort of, you yeah, yeah. You, like in profile and like, yeah, okay, oh, that, that's a good looking cat. And then it turns, it, <laughs> it turns around. Oh, dear. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh no. no. <laughs> Whoopsie daisy. Uh, what is this bulbous looking thing? <laughs> bulbous looking thing. Uh, yeah, so I, had to, I hope that cat comes back. I mean, it's, it, fe- it features in the trailer. It's, so much time goes into these trailers. And that cat is on there for like three or four seconds, and so much effort's clearly gone into it. I'm wondering it's been what, a, it, that cat has been in, at a lot of meetings as well. Like you know, every <laughs> element's been poured over. In yeah, after meeting and like maybe their arguments. Maybe they had a worse looking dog. Who knows? <laughs> maybe it was originally a dog, and they sort of like, how do we fix this, guys? <laughs> Quickly to the community <laughs> asset store. Ch- change the sliders. <laughs> Anything. <laughs> Uh, anyway, the game looks quite. The game looks, looks gorgeous. Uh, you, I think you just, she gets sucked into a fancy world and becomes a wizard by the looks of it. And then, get, uh, as soon as I started seeing the, the motion powers and just her bolting across rooftops and flying and dashing through the air, I was like, "Oh yeah, that looks great." Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll, there's some I'll just lovely sort of yeah, powers. sort of dashing through the air, semi flying stuff that looked really thrilling to to, to do. Yeah, and just massive elemental spell casting, including kind of. Uh, uh, two palms outstretched, like basically a machine gun, but with coming out of her palms. And I was like, oh, "That's not a bit of design there. That's pretty. That's <laughs> clever." Um, <laughs> what if what if you're a wizard who could shoot as well? Uh, coming to a Tom Francis game near you. <laughs> <laughs> I found it really fascinating, also because um, like it, the, the the main character is um person of color, and uh um uh, a woman, so. And it, the, the, the kind of the dialogue in the trailer, while I wouldn't say that it's kind of, you know, um, Oscar, uh, material exactly. Um, it's, it's kind of going over itself to emphasize kind of an emotional reaction to everything that happens in it. Yeah. Um, which games don't tend to do. Mostly it's like, hella cool. You've got an awesome gun. And that's the emotion <laughs> like that. That's where you go. And like, here's a fucking cool enemy. And there's your next emotion. And this one's kind of, you know, doing actual human emotions instead. And, and, you know, from a kind of a female's perspective, because it's lots of voiceover from, from the character. I really um, like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, and that I found that really interesting. It feels very, very much a post kind of life is strange game in many ways, kind of. And I wonder whether it's one of the marks like this is, you know, this is as high budget as games get these days. And if, if, you know, this global publisher is, is thinking, Hey, life is strange has, has exposed this enormous um, market basically for, for, for games, which are not, those traditional kind of it is not god of war <laughs> where the emotions yeah. are you know anxiety dad you know mm, mm. um male male centric stuff that's really interesting and exciting actually um and um you know that's that's what i that's my takeaway that's the take that's the take yeah it's, I've, I've played as so many 35 year old men and i <laughs> i am a 35 year old man and uh, it's it's you know it's just great to see different characters appearing. Actually, like uh, youthful ca- characters that are excited about their situation and what they're doing, which is life is yeah. strange. Like there's there's a kind of a youthful enthusiasm. I thought that about Kamala Khan in the Marvel Adventures game as well. Uh, and that there are loads of characters that are just kind of more earnestly into the fantasy of the thing, and, and yeah. without the kind of gruff aloofness and hard boiled attitude that you see in a lot of uh, typical leading characters. Uh, we're big at like a GTC talk about a decade ago and um, they flashed up a, a kind of uh, a big uh, series of um, 
uh, character headshots, and they all oh, just yeah. look like Nathan Drake. <laughs> just some some take on on that that They're one all formula. called Cole. <laughs> Cole or Jack or Jack Cole or some combination of those those common <laughs> names. And uh, yeah, it's just like well, you know, we, we have these incredible tools that let you model any world you want to, and uh, decide to go with this sort of market default <laughs> yeah. for, for everything because because maybe because it was assumed to be safe. Um, so I, I I I would like to see that applied to the environments in the game. I think because. Uh, you can get sucked into a cool fantasy world, but this one, I think all like, loads of fantasy worlds look exactly the same to me. Uh, they've got the How same do you like them, um, rock formations. Kind of, yeah, you, rock paper. Also, um, uh, if you want to do some ruins that you can't do better than a series of um, rings, half broken, poking up out of the, right. of the ground, kind of you know next to each other, to suggestive of something strange and eldritch and ancient as well. Yep, some um, underlit rock formations with some floating pebbles and stuff like that. It's just, uh, yeah, it, it's not. It's so so rote that it's it's not weird. It's the it's completely the opposite. I feel completely comfortable with that, <laughs> with floating rocks in games now. It's, it's lucky just, you've yeah. got the main character going. Wow, that's amazing. Is that oh good? Oh yeah, okay. So, I'm reminded that's... what I'm meant to be thinking now. Thank you. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's like, <laughs> oh no, yeah, this is supposed to be amazing and wondrous, and actually, oh no, it's it's an, it's another one of those. It's another monastery. <laughs> what if monasteries were slightly bigger than normal? Hmm. <laughs> 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 Makes you think. Uh, uh but yeah I, I, <laughs> uh, that's a i'm kind of nitpicking there um the main the main problem was the cat <laughs> uh and we've covered that so uh, I'm, I'm excited about this game it's due early next year i think like february or something, something like that very excited <laughs> what else is announced so uh kotor's getting a remake mm-hmm. isn't it that's cool i guess I, I, I'm not, it's hard to tell whether it's going to be like a significant, like they're going to do something new with a new engine or new assets or anything like that, or it's just going to be oh, it'll run a nice resolution but 4K. And they seem to. It so it's, it's being produced by uh, I'm gonna. I don't know. How, I've never heard the the this developer's name. Aspire. Said. I've only ever yeah, Aspire. Aspire maybe. Mm. But they've they've long been um, kind of porting specialists, especially for Mac, and a lot of them. A lot of the kind of the, these sort of RPGs from that generation and before, kind of to to various places, and um, and I think the message from them is that yes, it's kind of you know it's 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 a full full rework, you know, bells and whistles, um, mm, and cool. kind of like to a level that they wouldn't normally do. Like normally, it's fairly um, what's the word? Um, kind of just kind of functional. Uh, yeah, functional like you know, here's your, here's that game you loved, kind of with mm. f- modern resolutions and stuff. But um, I was fascinated by the fact that there is no mention at all of Bioware in any of the literature, like any of the the press release or the um, the kind of That's the weird. text during the um the trailer. The trailer is literally the f- mask of the the bad dude, the bad Reven. the bad Darth. Darth uh, Revan, yeah. the bad Darth. Yeah. They're all bad, Alex. <laughs> is that who? Darth, Darth Kind, is. apart from him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you just—it's it, a—it's a teaser. It's, it's massively just a teaser. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no mention of the actual original developers, which I found fascinating. That is odd, isn't it? It's like it's—it's uh, it's kind of baffling, isn't it? It's, maybe it's, it might just be like a administrative oversight. But to, <laughs> shit, we forgot to, to we made it. deleted the authors. Oh no! <laughs> Apparently, some of the original creators of Kotor are working on this as well. So it's sort of doubly odd that you wouldn't play into that. <laughs> so maybe, just, maybe hmm. Bioware's name is kind of not associated the, not with the, the, not, the str- not the not the not the seller that it was gone down with Anthem. Yeah, that would be a shame. It's Who knows? Bioware. Or maybe there's some sort of mad kind of legal reason who knows <laughs> yeah it's true true <laughs> but yes that, that's quite exciting i've never actually played oh no hang on i played about and um, two hours of it i um i got the um the xbox um the original xbox version and played it on 360 and it was so glitchy and ran so badly that i gave mm. up yeah i can't imagine it working properly on a console really uh it's i remember it's been years since i played it but i really liked it i think it's the reason why it's one of Bioware's most famous games, especially and it's it's back in a time where like games 
came up with really interesting treatments on the Star Wars universe, which sort of lent into some of the, a lot of the sort of side fiction that span off from the films. And the mm. idea that, you know, uh, KOTOR and KOTOR 2, especially from Obsidian, uh, it kind of just took a really interesting take on the Jedi, especially from a normal person's perspective on any planet where it's just these kind of weird, weird monks who are always at war and you don't know why. And the idea of light side or dark side is kind of an, uh, a, a kind of mad religious concept to you. And so it's, that's a really interesting take on it. Yeah. Um, of course. Like, yeah, because I'm, I'm yeah. kind of aware from the, from sort of outside of Star Wars and outside of this game that a lot of it is not, is kind of firm canon like be you know mm. this is star wars that story is very much part of star wars yeah and like revan's a really cool character um and it's a reason why he, so in, in the mmo i think they added revan as a as a boss at one point huh. and it was a really massive deal they did a really good job of it um really nice dungeons in that game it's got a funny robot in it as well hasn't it it's got a funny robot it's got a hk unit uh <laughs> yeah. who's it's kind of a murderous assassin robot and uh completely honest about that <laughs> <laughs> and that so seems to set a kind of like a tone for some of the stuff that sort of followed around um star wars as well i mean maybe, maybe there yeah. are precedents in in others other me like star wars media but um yeah like i'd see shades of that in stuff that i saw in the mandalorian and things yeah and uh, was there a big kind of sardonic robot in rogue one i think is rogue one probably uh, played by alan tudyk who was washed in firefly because we all live in the nerd universe now where everything is connected <laughs> by nerd rage. Some, some <laughs> description. It's cool though. I'm glad it's coming back. I'm interested to see it. Will I play it again? No. <laughs> <laughs> you will. Oh, you will. maybe. You will. And Chris will. Chris will definitely. Yeah, I think the rich uh, McCormick might as well. <laughs> Have a KOTOR party. <laughs> I think the, the best thing about the remake for me is that if it does well, it kind of proves that there's an audience for Knights of the Old Republic stuff. So we might see more more from that universe. It's a really, really cool part of the, the fiction to explore. And I'd love to see a kind of like bells and whistles modern uh, kind of take on that. It'd be awesome. Throw all the money at it. Yeah. Throw all of the tech. Good, good. Absolutely. What else was announced? Is that is that most of the news? Those are the ones that caught my eye. Yeah, I think we've, we've we've consumed the news. Any thoughts about Uncharted? It's just Tomb Raider, isn't it? You play Tomb Raider, but it's, but, but, but really pretty. <laughs> I've always liked it, and I've it's good fun. Don't see any point in a remake because uh, it looked great on PS4. <laughs> yeah, it did. <laughs> Which is the kind same kind of story as um, Chuck and the Torto. I was kind of umming ahhing about whether to mention it. There's been mm. a bit of a backlash against. The, the Grand Theft Auto uh, trailer that uh, Rockstar um, showed because, I mean, <laughs> if the game already looks like that, especially if you put some mods on on PC, and yeah. there's yeah. just nothing in any way extraordinary about it. But, you know, you're going to be expected to spend a bunch of money to um, to be playing it on PS5. Uh, the first bullet point in the trailer is... Um, Oh, well, I can't remember the phrasing exactly. Seamless. I think it was seamless character transitions or something like that. You know, back in the day, I played it on PS3, which was probably the worst no, version blimey, to play. Yeah. Um, and changing between characters took, you know, a long time of loading. Uh, so the trailer shows you zipping between, char you know, the, the camera, pop, you know, legendarily kind of zooms out to a kind of satellite yeah. view and then zooms in on the map where they are the, the other character of the three that you had to take control of in the story is um uh and you know it's it feels incredibly seamless however it was pointed out <laughs> by players that if you play the um the the version of you know G gta 5 made for xbox the last generation of xbox on your new generation xbox it's incredible um ssd technology is already doing that <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, of course it is yeah so nobody needs that game in many for many reasons and you know i think i feel very much that um on uncharted the dust has not settled on that game like it looks extraordinary or still it like it yeah. you know the way the like we are definitely especially with with remakes like that in the um ever di ever diminishing returns land because mm. they were good already yeah they're already beautiful you're sort of like looking at a something 
you had to really get to the guts of the game to actually give it any extra flourish. Like Control did well with like its um, ray tracing and stuff like that. That was a fairly significant update, I think. That does probably if you've got a brand new PC, it's like, ooh, look at that shadow. Um, <laughs> whereas it feels as though those games, especially stuff like Uncharted, which is kind of a kind of roller coaster game, there are relatively open sections in parts of Uncharted 4 actually which are really fun drive around yeah. desert environments and do little platforming puzzles here and there yeah um but fundamentally like so much love and attention has been applied to every texture in that game already just mm. I don't know what, what you do to it <laughs> it already looks like I a think, ro- yeah, all the rocks are like rocks now <laughs> so yeah exactly yeah I think that I think that sort of Naughty Dog are, are the kind of developer who 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 make what they do make perfectly and mm. And everything else is a matter of um, incredibly careful um, optimization, yeah. which means that th- the game design that you play is built around what that generation of con- hardware can do. If you want a new Uncharted, uh, like a, a next gen one, that's the wrong way to say it. Like the um, updating the graphics is not really the point of a next gen kind of Uncharted. It is all of the extra streaming and things that it could do to make larger environments and them having to do fewer optimization tricks in order to make everything look good. You know, I just don't see any point in, in kind of buffing up what's already there because it's already at the peak, you know? Yeah. It feels as though like the real question when it comes to visuals is kind of where you put the energy. And I'm really pleased to see more and more energy going into performance capture and tailoring performances on characters Mm. um, to get to the stage where I, I like, I do find it much easier, increasingly easier to, you know, be carried along by the emotional journey the character is having because they are reacting to things and uh, they're not kind of somewhere horrible in the uncanny valley anymore. Like there's occasionally when a, a character smiles, often like very extreme expressions can still look really weird sometimes, um, and and uh, sometimes that cat happens. And, you know, <laughs> there's no accounting for it. Uh, Hats but... off to that hat. That <laughs> reminder. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but for the most part, like, it's awesome seeing. So, in um, the game we were talking about earlier, the, uh, oh, what's it called? I've forgotten, I forget what the name is, Forspoken. Um, like, the, the performance on, the performance capture on her is fantastic. It's, like, it's almost photo realistic at points. Um, that's the sort of thing the next gen gets me excited about. But I'm not sure we need, like, super machines to achieve that. Maybe it's more just kind of uh, developers choosing thing. to put more resources into that, like uh, that aspect of games to make yeah. the characters more interesting. But I don't. Yeah, uh, I totally agree. Yeah. Mm. So that's all the that's all the announcements I think that so we can that's remember. Every announcement that's ever happened this year. We've just Actually, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> We've done it. Gone through it all. Um, so I've probably been playing some games. What have you been playing, Alex? Oh, well, uh, I've been, I haven't had much time to play games, but I did play one that I was kind of, um, just caught my eye. Um, it's called Beat Blast. Um, and it is a musical, uh, roguelike geometry wars. <laughs> Ooh, one of them. <laughs> so, um, uh, so you, I mean, it's like geometry wars. So it's a twin six shooter. Um, uh, it is roguelike in the sense that you're kind of moving through a space and upgrading your ship, uh, your weapons and general abilities and whatnot, and getting as far as you can. And there being kind of unlocks as you go, as you play, um, kind of making the game or broadening it out and making aspects of it easier and allowing you to get further and all that kind of thing. And it's musical because, and this is the this is the cool thing about it. Um, because your weaponry um, works on a um, like a, a beat sequencer thing, um, oh, which is at the cool. bottom left corner of the screen. Uh, so you have um, you have four different weapons, uh, which sort of ascribe to four different um, channels um, or in your kind of in your um, sequencer, um, and you can place. Uh, what become called notes um, that you earn over the course of playing into the sequencer. And when the timeline hits a note that you place in the sequencer, it'll shoot that weapon um, Mm. out. Um, The the four weapons are one that uh, sends a shot, a three purple 
three way shot that's short range. There is a longer range, I don't like a, a blue one, which is slightly longer range and um, explosive when it hits um, and hard hitting. And there is a green one, which uh, shoots further and faster. And then there is a yellow one, which uh, sends out a shockwave from your ship. And it is totally up to you. At any point, you can shift around the notes that you've put into your sequencer and change uh, the way your ship shoots completely. Um, you've got these little kind of, um, kind of uh, if you put two notes into the same uh, beat, uh, the same kind of time point in the sequence. So say if I put um, one in the, the purple three spread shot and one in the blue explosive shot, now it will shoot three blue explosive shots. Uh, when when the timeline goes to that point, so like there are little kind of uh, little things you'll be thinking about, like that little adjacency bonuses, I suppose you'd call them, oh, which cool. give a little depth to it. Um, and it's really really is clever. And of course, as you're doing it, uh, it's playing music um, because each of those kind of those weapons will make a certain music. And it, as you go through, you'll also find musical notes, um, which are basically uh, instruments that you can plug it will choose to have in any of those weapons. Uh, so you're kind of choosing the sound that, that you're making as you're going along. Um, and I've actually had some quite nice tunes. I actually, uh, hopefully this will work. We did try this before the show, uh, but I'm going to try and play live some of that music. So it might be some weird buzzy nouns, but here we go. this is what it sounds like in play. <laughs> So each of those kind of notes is a different bullet firing. So little um, stabbing sounds. Yeah. So I've got some some uh, triple firing, fast firing, long shots. I've got three blue ones in line, kind of going, kind of thump thump thump. And it's um, it's kind of really chilled. <laughs> I was about, I was about to say I was expecting something when you described it more kind of uh, aggressive than this. This feels like kind of. Quirky, plinky, plonky. This yeah, is a it is. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Look at this nice <laughs> corridor type music. <laughs> Let me think of that. Exactly. I'll just turn it off. How does it look? It's um, it's 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 very vectory. It's sort of it's mm. definitely leaning on the um the the Geometry Wars uh, look, but honestly, not with any of that impact and artistry. Like Geometry Wars did lots of kind of effects of kind of these sort of. Uh, distortion effects as stuff hits to kind yeah. of, sort of emphasize thumping weapons and things and that would be my main sort of criticism of um of beat blast um like things don't really thump and they don't really have impact and um and it's sort of like some of the kind of like the crunch isn't really there like um I'm, I'm getting hit quite a lot um and it's not like there are huge numbers of enemies on the screen, certainly not in the first kind of level, set of levels. Um, uh, but I'll just kind of wander into the into the into into a bullet because you just sort of slide into it and it all feels a little bit weightless as a mm. result. It doesn't have that um, kind of, um, uh, you know, that, that sort of the crunch that you get in a, um, oh, who did Nuclear Throne? Um, you know, the classic sort of indie, kind of thumpy kind of twin stick sort of game design you know like you know nuclear throne where hmm. like for example what i'd love in beat blast is if there's just an element of, of slowdown just as you get close to a, an enemy bullet which emphasizes how close it is and makes you feel it feel, feel dangerous while also easing things a little bit um those sorts of things make games really fun yeah. and i think yeah. this really lacks that kind of thing it doesn't help that because it's really leaning on this kind of really chilled out music effect that you're building as you're going along um you don't have kind of a sense of threat even though like you you know in general you'd only have three hearts um as you used to go in so you can only take three hits um so that that's a bit of a shame but i have played quite a few games now back to back because because I want to just try out the weapons and it, and it really helps that um, the upgrades and things are really, really interesting um, and surprising. Um, 
the one of the first and i've been trying to recapture ever since one of the first runs i did i got an ability called spiral bullets and that meant that instead of shooting out as you'd expect them to the bullets would fire out and so they started orbiting my ship <laughs> and so i became this kind of whirling dervish of a of mm. kind of like of well colorful death and it was marvelous i'd want really really fun wanted to go back to that um at one point i got a sword and that, like, instead of firing bullets, I was swinging a sword. And obviously that was a bit shit and it was really dangerous because <laughs> I had to go close to stuff. Um, but <laughs> I won't be doing that again. But, you know, so that was, but it was a really expressive and interesting thing to try out. Um, uh, I had a thing where mines would shoot out. So there's a, um, oh, what's it called now? You have like a, um, a, a, a mega beat i can't remember what it's called now it's not called a mega beat but it's this thing that um will, will come into the first um s- sort of um, time slot in the sequence and at that point it will trigger uh and mines uh well in, in my case i got three mines it was like a, a legendary level one so there were some extra bonuses and things and three mines would pop out the front and they would start homing towards um enemies that was really nice i got one where these barriers would come out and they and enemy bullets would be attracted to them therefore not to me i got some orbiting little kind of dots which um absorbed enemy bullets instead um like there's loads of stuff that you collect over the course of a, a run and they've therefore felt really really different and i'm really kind of interested to to kind of explore more of those um and i've only really got into the second world and because the the challenge really ramps up um get a lot more enemies and you start having to output quite a lot of damage to just to clear them all um and um and so yeah i, I kind of am very aware that i've got to kind of get a lot better for that but you get all these passive unlocks as you play you can choose you can mess around with the difficulty level that you are playing at so for example you can set it so you actually start with five hearts rather than three um and that will kind of you know you have freedom to do that and it will show you that 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 your the, the difficulty of your run has gone down a certain amount i think it's sort of kind of like a you know how how hard do you want it to be kind of thing mm. rather than in a mechanical way which is really nice you know hey I, I want more hearts but i also want to have more elite level enemies generating fine yeah, you just cool. switch them on and more of those options unlock over time uh, over that's really nice. and that's a, that's a really generous nice thing there's a compete option in the menu which um which is a weekly challenge which you can replay um when that has set kind of um uh modifiers for for a bat- for the for your for your runs um and that that's really interesting as well particularly as kind of those modifiers change like uh, we're acting for me as a little um you know insights into some of the stuff that's kind of i come come across in the game yet like these sort of very fast moving bullets and whatnot i really like it um you know, it's sort of just, I think, just at the end of, um, I think it's been out in early access for a while, but it came out as sort of 1.0 uh, uh, late last month. I would really like a bit more attention to those kind of crunchy, hey, let's get things slowing down when you're in danger. And, you know, those nuclear throny sort of heart in mouth, sort of second to second kind of game design stuff. But as a as a, as a a thing to do where in the middle of the game you can completely change the way that your ship is you can change it to being this kind of melee based thing because all of you most of your notes you've invested in your um kind of the 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 yellow short range pulse weapon go for it and probably dangerous but you know mix that up with some other stuff test it out change it just hear something new like at the the game feels sounds fresh as well. Yep, I recommend it. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Awesome. What was that one called? Beat Blast. Beat Blast. Beat sounds Blast. really, really fun. Yeah. So, yeah. Sounds really cool. Yeah. I was um, actually uh, inspired by one of our last chats on the podcast. I had been playing a bunch of um, shmups and uh, I've, uh, nice. particularly like uh, Mushihimi Sama. <laughs> yes so yeah, i banged good. on that on the pod a while back yeah it's really good isn't yeah, it yeah <laughs> i just wanted to kind of like uh just flag it up again as being ace and such a bonkers premise for a shmup 
why and it's it's like a you're, you're fighting all these insects and they're, they're some of them are just massive kind of flying caterpillars that are bigger than the screen and you're kind of like trying to take armor chunks off them as you're desperately <laughs> trying to dodge bullets and then it's also kind of a love story or something <laughs> i don't know yeah it's, you're it's a princess happens. you're going somewhere on the back of an insect on the back of a beetle yeah and there's a, to rescue the spirit of the forest or something um <laughs> it's actually it's, it's like wait a minute does this game have a story <laughs> <laughs> beyond the thousands and thousands of bright pink bullets it, it looks it's just a weird imaginative thing that's really I, I felt my whole body completely tensed up <laughs> throughout the whole thing as well. It's just that the, the way it keeps up the pressure on you all the time. Yeah. And then uh, the, when you actually pop something big, you get um, the sudden relief of all those bullets instantly stopping. And there's, there's a really nice uh, touch talking about those kind of like really small bits of game design that really kind of have that, have carry emotional weight. It's when you kill something big, uh, all the bullets pop and vanish in transit. Uh, for right, a, yeah. a lot of these enemies instead of continuing on their path like a Kruger does uh, or something else and that is actually that that's that exaggerates the the sense of relief and it gives you that massive kind of uh hit of uh adrenaline from like phew god yeah I just survived that yeah I, you I kind of like myself. fear from sort of overwhelmed to sudden relief and then back to overwhelmed like it's just very quickly yeah kind of going yeah. up and then down and then up and then down oh so good it's really, and the way really they explode bothered. is just so good as well <laughs> it's great like, icker and kind of tokens and kind of bullets and oh so good <laughs> i just think about the um when you call something really really big the the frame rate intentionally slows down uh yeah. so to to sell it sort of watching it come apart but it's uh, it's like the frame rate drops like intentionally i think it's, it's not like the, the game can't handle the fact that a giant insect oh, no it, i think it is i think it is i think the the slowdown is technical like they are oh, getting it? too much into it because it's it's a perfect um uh emulation of the oh, original hardware okay the original that's RK interesting so, i thought cause yeah. I, I assumed it might be a choice because um it just again it's that relief moment of seeing a thing slowly come apart but uh, it's kind of funny that that might be <laughs> completely oh, but it's, it's definitely used as an, as an aesthetic and actually sort of mechanical thing because it allows you to actually cope with the sheer yeah. enormity of all the <laughs> bullets what's on going board. on <laughs> yeah that's fabulous stuff. Yeah, yeah. so I just want to say I've been really, really enjoying that. It's a good recommendation. Um, yeah, it's good. Is it Cave? Maybe this one? It's, it's a Cave one. Yeah. yeah. No, the cave one's They're actually, um, so if, if you, so they are releasing a lot of um, their games on Switch at the moment. So I think Machine Miss Sama is, is came out maybe a few weeks ago and Ooh. Espacaluda 2 or maybe with just one. Um, that came out this week, I believe. Oh, so fantastic. yeah like the switch is is rapidly become the schmuck machine <laughs> that's awesome but it's all on pc too of course yeah of course <laughs> what have you been playing apart from mushi misama uh i've been playing speaking of uh games where you, uh, you can play them portably as well i've been playing divinity original sin 2 oh uh, nice it's a, it's a very good rpg alex is i really like this one uh, i think we've talked about it before on the podcast um but it definitely, uh, it de it definitely rewards sort of <laughs> lots more talking about i think so it's, it's um the reason i went back to it is because you can play it on the ipad the ipad version is fantastic it looks oh, really it looks incredible and there's loads of kind of bespoke touch controls uh it takes a little bit of getting used to but it's the full divinity 2 experience on ipad and uh, crucially, uh, it shares saves with the Steam version, so oh, I, I could close down the iPad and then boot up Steam, and there's, it just automatically cl the cloud pulls it from the cloud, and I could just pick it up on PC and carry on playing exactly oh, where I was. I mean, it's that's amazing. the dream, isn't it? It's the dream, that's, and that's... yeah, for it to work so so well, um, is is just kind of feels like oh my god, if we're really in 2021 now, it's the future. This is it's just like a basic bit of functionality is so so nice, and, uh, feels kind of magic. Um, and it, it, it is much, much easier to play on PC in terms of just like looking around the world and especially when you're kind of trying to uh, carefully position an area of effect attack during combat uh, using like my big fat finger is just nowhere near as good as kind of just <laughs> a nice bit, a nice mouse pointer. Uh, but it certainly works. It certainly works. And it, it's very, it's a game that rewards taking time um, because it's actually, one of the things that really struck me about it is that it's quite difficult. And uh, it's difficult in a way that has forced me to 
engage with the systems and actually learn the game. Mm. Um, whereas for many games that are difficult, I have a completely opposite reaction um, uh, where I basically sort of buzz off it and often think, um, well, I have not seen the promise of the game yet, so I don't feel as though I want to invest a lot of time and mental energy in trying to figure out the systems, especially if they're poorly explained. Uh, whereas there's something about Divinity Original Sin 2 that kind of, the the, the promise is so evident <laughs> that it kind of, it, it invites you to learn more about its kind of unusual system where characters have um as well as their health bar they've got like an armor bar and a magic armor bar and uh crowd control skills are really really powerful in the game when you knock people down or freeze them in place uh, it basically gives you loads of free attacks uh, but they only work when you've drained one or the other uh, mm-hmm. of those of those shields um and th- th- so you could magic spells take effect obviously when the magic barrier barrier is down and there are kind of like big punchy fighter moves that you can knock people down when the physical one is expended of course different attacks attack different at one of those two shields differently um and so this is really interesting tactical puzzle game to kind of focusing your party on perhaps two different characters and having your mages take down some of their magic bars and having your fighters take down some of the different enemies armor bars so that you can then unleash all of your crowd control effects and finish them on the ground um and if the game kind of like came out of the gate and explained that to you it would be like well screw that <laughs> that sounds <laughs> horrendously complicated i don't want to do that at all but uh, because fights are so important in the game and there's so much kind of you could lose so much because uh resurrection scrolls are, are rare and very expensive uh, and so losing a character, having a character knocked down is a huge deal. So if you want to carry on with the adventure and kind of like go through fights with enough of a party left intact to complete the game, and you can, you can fail, <laughs> you can get all of the characters you could pick up killed. And that's, that's the end of the game. You can't progress. So you've got to load an earlier save. Um, so in order to kind of avoid that fate, you've got to kind of engage with the systems. And it's a way of kind of, it's, it's, it's an interesting carrot stick balance in this game that I think a lot of RPGs in particular are not very good at. Uh, it's, it creates scarcity in the resources, and this is true of money as well, which is stuff is very expensive, which means that uh, suddenly putting uh, points into barter skills is actually very useful is because you want to get those resurrection scrolls. Mm. And think of how many RPGs you play when money is just pointless. Yeah. Like it's almost like money has to exist because society exists and society has money in it, right? So here's a resource for you. It's to something kind of, that can drop yeah. without having to put any imagination into what that it, drop might be. Yeah, that's really true. You'd have to just design individual items. Then everything is just generically money, <laughs> and yeah. you just gain it massively. And also, it's not you don't have to design. You don't have to. It's not a visual asset. It's just a number on a on a character sheet. Um, whereas in this, like got, um, that money does let you buy very very functional items and because of those armor bars uh, the the magic barrier and the shield the armor barrier uh, you really want to invest in armor and make sure that you've got great armor to stop your enemies from uh blowing through your barriers to get uh, those crowd control spells off on you it's a really good little race that happens in each combat um it, and it rewards uh you could kind of like splitting up it rewards you splitting your party up and positioning mm. them so that your archers are your range characters if they're significantly higher than enemies they get like a 30 percent damage bonus on their stuff mm. really significant so whenever it, it, again it avoids the thing that lots of RPGs do where you can get tiny incremental bonuses everywhere and none of it feels like it matters whereas in divinity 2 if you're getting an advantage you're getting a massive advantage um and it's something that you want to seek out and actually try and you know manipulate the environment to present you with those opportunities because 30 percent is a significant enough upgrade to actually make that worthwhile mm. uh so it's, it's the, the carrot stick balance the way the combat works um the scarcity of the economy all of that is what makes it a very crunchy and satisfying rpg even though if to look at it, it looks like quite a light and breezy affair it's anything mm. but and i find it also kind of uh getting far enough away from D while still kind of retaining some of the uh, some of the really, really good stuff about D&D. So I, personally, I really like that you only get to level 20 in D&D, that leveling up is a really big deal. Um, and where you put like two skill points has a massive effect on dice maths and mm-hmm. stuff like that. But uh, that is intact in Divinity 2 and their system as well. Um, and again, it's about incentivizing, uh, like every choice you make, putting stuff into a skill is going to reward you. 
Um, yeah. uh, though uh, one thing it does have is that there's as far as I can tell, there's no advantage whatsoever to uh, spreading your points across multiple skills for each character. You want to specialize because yeah. they're, they're so targeted and like you, you've built a mage that is designed to strip mage shields and uh, putting yourself into anything that doesn't do that is pointless. But for the most part, I'd, I'd still I'd want to call it out as a really nice bit of RPG design. Um, yeah, for uh, sure. Really it's quite interesting because at the same time, it's got that sort of, you know, um, the, all those elemental things in it. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, like a, a battlefield can very quickly divulge into total chaos. And that's also, you know, that works surprisingly well with how um, careful and strategic it is or tactical it is. It does. It's also immediately rewarding in a way that uh, a lot of the, like, fighters get a, a, a tough class to realize in RPGs because um, they go up and they often, you get one animation where they have to swing a thing at someone and then yeah. some numbers happen and that's the interaction. What and, ability do you want to use? I want to use the hitting them ability <laughs> yeah. with my sword. <laughs> exactly. Um, whereas, like, if this because there's such a kind of physicality to the, the elemental state of the world and, and stuff breaking and, uh, and again, to that elevation, uh, the mechanics around elevation that like physically moving your fighters around in that environment is really important. And, uh, coupled that with the fact that mages are absolutely, uh, like they will burn you as much as they burn the enemy. Like <laughs> they, they, they it's friendly fire is, uh, on for most abilities, and that makes them a liability, frankly, <laughs> in a way that's that's really funny and entertaining. Uh, and even uh, and it's sort of like you could poke around with the game without understanding any of its systems and immediately get a, a fireworks display out of it that makes you think, oh man, that was. I'm, I mean, everyone's dead and I'm ir- ir- irreversibly <laughs> screwed, but that was kind of fun. <laughs> At least <laughs> before I died, there, there were lots of sparks and explosions and things. That was good, uh, and it kind of like. It, it makes it very apparent that you need to be quick saving all the time. Um, and it's, it's, it's well checkpointed as well. Uh, I find, which is essential if you're going to have a punishing system like that. Um, and I find myself like replaying fights just to not lose one person. Uh, mm. and the fact I, I felt the need to do that and didn't get bored of it just shows you how much is kind of going on in that combat system. Um, uh, <laughs> And I think it's going to sustain the, hopefully it sustains the interest further into the game. Uh, I'm still on the first island, which is massive. <laughs> so much yeah, like to that it. First, yeah, it's huge, huge, it's huge. It's really game. big. It's like a, 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 probably the size of an RPG unto itself, really. Yeah. Meet so many interesting characters and stuff. But like the, the main sort of whatever the turbo big quest behind everything is, it's not even happening yet, really. <laughs> Just kind of like going from fight to fight and meeting lots of uh, kind of desperate people in this it's a nice, nice world building. There's a real sense of humor to a lot of the dialogue and stuff. But yeah. oh, what's your main that, character? I, I'm playing as the Red Prince. Of course, uh, you are. Who, yes, yes, yes. Which is, it's the first one it serves up to you, and with good reason because you, a you, you play a giant red lizard, and that's also awesome. I love the character models in this game, and the armor design and stuff is properly kind of old school D and D, but with extra color and uh, and flair compared to the Forgotten Realms. Um, so yeah, giant lizard and uh, the Red Prince. His backstory is that he's obviously uh, he's nobility and he's been hunted by uh, uh, the Shadow Clan or something. Um, the lizard people are after him, uh, even though he used to run the kingdom. Um, and also, uh, the lizards are famous slavers as well. So there's the kind of like darkness behind your character that you can lean into. Uh, and each uh, of those characters, they get their own specialized dialogue choices so you can lean into the arrogance uh, mm. of being the red prince uh, and being like you could be awful you could be a really bad person <laughs> which yeah, is I, like, I love that which is great uh and is exactly how it should be but i really like the voice acting as well like almost all, all of it's voiced um which is really nice and there's actually explicitly a narrator who uh, they, they're kind right, of yeah. there always is kind of flavor text that links dialogue options in uh like Baldur's Gate and stuff like that but having someone dramatically read it all out it gives it this storybook feel that it's very much going for uh and makes it feel a, a little bit more like there is a dm there yeah like talking you through and like dropping jokes in and stuff like that and it's also yeah. got brilliant stuff like the ability uh you could choose to take an ability that lets you talk to animals and then you get dialogue from every animal in the game if you want to <laughs> which is wild <laughs> it's not just wild it's, it's really really cool like, I, have, I had a really interesting conversation with a rat earlier <laughs> who was just kind of lingering around a corpse and it was it sort of like had all this dialogue about, you know, the secret world beneath the sands that he lives in. <laughs> like, well, this is amazing. Completely yeah. incidental dialogue. It's, it's not contributed to anything, but it's really good stuff. Love it. 
Really good. Oh my god, there are so many things. I'm just remembering so much in that game now. You've got you've <laughs> so much for you to find. <laughs> I I love the Skellington man. Ah, uh, Thane, he's good. I like yeah. Thane. Um, yeah. So the the very first thing you get from him is that um, yeah. So uh, you, you could go out in public uh, as a, as a visibly obviously undead person, <laughs> and uh, it, you know just your skull place, and it freaks everyone the flip out <laughs> like people cannot handle it rightly so <laughs> because it's talking terrifying skeleton man but uh it's uh the first helmet you find is a bucket the buckets are actually just everywhere in the world but you can wear them uh and a that's really funny uh but b it actually has a, a proper effect on the game if you're playing as thane as the main character or you can create your own characters as well you could choose to be an undead um so it, because you, you you might sometimes want that reaction you might want to freak someone out by being undead or you might want to, uh, as Thane would put it, like glide through the world a little easier and wear a mask that you've taken off a corpse or something. <laughs> and they managed to find this sort of, it's very kind of, uh, some of it's slapstick and some of it is kind of like wanting to be awful, you know, like Red Prince is kind of just being, being a bastard. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. But actually they, they always find kind of, you know, quite an affecting thread through these characters at the same time. I was really impressed with that. Like the, you know, you can be entertained and also find some depth to them always. Yeah, definitely. Like there's a, uh, they kind of, they cleave, a, they do cleave kind of to uh, Dungeons and Dragons stereotypes. The Dungeons is just an obvious touchstone for it, even though I think it's significantly different from it and does its own thing. Um, but you do have your kind of chaotic evil rogue um assassin type character but then but she then you realize quickly that she's on a revenge quest to find uh, the person the slavers who gave her the scar that she has and i was playing as the red prince who comes from a family that you know is famous around the world for being slavers i was like oh wow this this is kind of this world is very light touch and full of humor but actually that's a really interesting thorny interaction that i'm in and it deals it as well yeah she has an attitude (laughs) Yeah, that's she, one of the things she hates it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that's one of, the, one of the things I really enjoyed about it is um, our, I don't think this is too much of a spoiler, but effectively, like the the overall quest is that one of you is one of the one of the party, one of the main characters is the chosen one, mm. and your character, you know, you have a party of these characters, but you're playing one of them, and um, and fundamentally, all of the characters want to be the chosen one. <laughs> Yeah. you're going through the world and doing these quests together and you know that there's going to be a reckoning and mm. i found that just f- that's fantastic yeah really cool yeah there's been lots of hints dropped dropped that way um and it's yeah it's there's i like the world uh it's full of just sudden moments of cruelty that are really unexpected i, I, I don't mean that oh the cruel worlds are great by any means but i think um it's very well realized. So at the moment I'm in some marshlands that were ruled by like a long dead guy who did experiments uh, with, with his gang on, on people. And um, the, the new kind of religious cult that's taken over the island is pulling up weapons that he developed from the earth and using them to kind of oppress the local population. It's just, and I was like, oh, I'd read a book about that. It's really good. And just having that be a fairly incidental bit of world building in this particular area, that I'm sure it'll yeah. drop right afterwards. Just speaks to the quality of of like the depth of the the storytelling and the the, the world building that's gone into Divinity, which is a universal. I know there's been a few Divinity games, haven't there? I, I had absolutely zero interest in before playing this. I've come to it completely cold, um, and I've been completely sucked in by it. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. Very good. So one of the things I was thinking about all the way through that you keep bringing up, we kept bringing up D and D. Of course, that studio, Larian, yes, uh, has been making Baldur's Gate three, which is explicitly D and D. Have you have, like? Are you like me, not playing it until because it's still in early I'm, access? I'm exactly it? the same. I, yeah. I really want to play the finished version where they polish everything and all the quests are in. Um, because I'm gonna, I'm only gonna play it once. I'm gonna play. There's such big games. There's so much to them. I, I, I want to kind of chart one path through it and have that have the memories of that one playthrough. So I want, uh, I want the game in its fullest possible state before I, I go in there. It looks really cool though. Um, I don't know how long it's it's gonna it, due to be in early access. It might just be kind of there until it's done type thing. Um, but it does look really cool. Yeah, yeah. excited for it. Yeah, I kind of think keep thinking oh, I should play it, but then. It's going to get better, isn't it? Because I certainly found better. actually yeah. with um, even with uh, um, Original Sin 2, um, I played it and then they did a big update and my save just 
Oh no! All saves were were um, scrapped. Yeah, it's all right. that, yeah, you know, you kind of think, oh, it's, it's, the game's better now, but oh fuck, I've got to start again. But then you start again, and you have that extra little bit of knowledge, and you think, actually, I want to try that character, and mm-hmm. and there's a fresh new game there, and because you go to the different locations on that island in a different order, and you know, that new adventure actually feels very much its own thing. It didn't feel like too much like. Um, you know, um, treading the same ground, which I, is yet another kind of incredibly good thing about this game because it's just so dense and going exploring the island. You do feel like it's opening up for you as opposed to, yeah, right, definitely. we we've made this content and we're going to damn well make sure that you discover it. So there's going to be a very obvious funneling towards you know this area of swamp where the the bad guy's been making horrible things in the past. Um, yeah, like you feel like you stumble on it um, and you kind of have to think your way into getting into a lot of places. Yeah. And it makes it feel very much your own. And then you realize that, that oh, there's a totally different way of doing that same yeah, thing totally. you did before. I, I'd oh, exactly so the same good. thing. Because uh, the classic thing is uh game gives you choice. And what that often means is there's a vent somewhere if you want. Uh, yeah. There's, there's yeah. the front door. Do and you want to go through the vent, the front door? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah, so equivalent. Like it's one of those two things. Whereas with this, um, there are so many, like, it must have been a nightmare to design because it, the whole location feels open and porous. But there are only a few ways, to, like, it very carefully gates your progress. Yeah. And that's uh, just and about giving you teleport. Like, it, yeah, <laughs> which is so Early on, good. it says, <laughs> you, you get this very obvious quest saying, like, this is where you learn how to teleport. And then you think, oh, my Lord, look what we can do now. We can break the game. And yeah, you know, right. the world is it's designed all around it. But very it feels so it. powerful. <laughs> it's an amazing ability to get because it's endlessly useful in every aspect of the game it's just sometimes it's just quicker to teleport a mate over to talk to someone yeah. <laughs> uh, and and it's also you could use it anytime in combat it's it's a brilliant example of just a, a, again we were talking earlier about everything having utility and if you get if you get something um or you choose to wear the item that gives you this skill and you might take like a stat hit for it like other thing other gloves or whatever might be better in stat terms um, no, you make the choice because you get this power, and that that is that is really good item itemization, um, and that power like I love to use it in combat to drop people into fires that are <laughs> happening. So I, I'll pluck an archer off a, off his tower and just drop him in some flames, and it's like ah. Oh. I remember the origin of that spell, which came from a story, and it was intended to let me get to past a certain place physically, but now it has this combat utility and will be with me. I think for the rest of the game, it's really yeah. good. Just one little <laughs> example of how clever the game is. <laughs> ah, so good. Ah, oh, I'm glad you've been playing it. It's been good to to. I've I've got it. it I I haven't finished it. It's so long. I think Marsh mm, finished massive. it, but wow. he took a long time to make it to finish it. And it does um, reward. It does reward that effort. <laughs> Shall we do questions from questions? Let's do question from questions. Um, actually, we've only got one question. Uh, on that note, I, 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 I was, I, I'll say this now. I'll say it now. Um, you might have noticed, uh, dear listeners, that we haven't had that many questions lately. And that's because we haven't been reading any out, I should say. That's because we haven't actually been receiving that many questions. And that kind of makes sense because um, we've had a lot of questions over the years, over 380 episodes. Um and so maybe we've answered more well, badly uh, all of the questions or a lot of the questions. Um, so we were thinking that um, we're actually doing a lot of thinking about um, the format of the show and that kind of thing. And um, maybe one of the things that we think about is audience participation um, in the show and um, what kinds of ways you'd like to interact with us as we, um, as we, as we pod. Um, if you have any ideas, maybe you wanted to, to ask us to play certain games um i don't know i don't know let us know uh at um crate and crowbar of oh, what is it <laughs> crate and crowbar <laughs> at gmail.com uh uh i'll say some more details on how to get in touch at the end of the show but um yeah let us know about if you have any ideas for ways you'd like to interact with us and things you'd like us to do basically uh because well any chance to to freshen up the stuff is always a good thing right it is a good thing. Um, in the meantime, we'll do a question from question. Uh, and this person in question comes from James, who writes, 
Dear CNC, your correspondent in, uh, in episode 379, which is our last one, uh, described the enjoyment we found in playing every level of Doom from a pistol-only start. In 1993, at 12 years old and playing a copy of Knee Deep in the Dead from a cover disc of PC Review, I found Doom technologically astounding, but so intense I couldn't cope with it for more than 15 minutes at a time. As the kind of person who always reads the instructions for everything, I said to read me carefully. Buried in there somewhere beneath the plot explanation was an option to disable the monsters. Not in the cheat codes that everyone knew. ID KFA, ID SP, SP I know this one. ID <laughs> SPISPOPD. My, I think my fingers, I think, think I still have the muscle memory for that one. Anyway, uh, but not one of those, but an actual command line switch. You just had to start the game with the command doom hyphen no monsters and all the terrifying threat would be eliminated. It seems a much easier way to play. And it was a documented option, not a cheat code. So it was legitimate. Sadly, the end of the, the ending of the final level of shareware doom, shareware doom is triggered by killing two barons of hell who appear in the final room. With no monsters there, there was no way to complete the game. I didn't have a save from an earlier level, so even after restarting with monsters, I could only get them back if I died and restarted the level with just the pistol, which was too hard for 12-year-old me. (laughs) That sounds quite familiar, really. Uh, uh, The question that James asks is, what games have you inadvertently ruined for yourself with a rule you really shouldn't have used? Actually, Doom is a really good example. Uh, mine would be that I just IDKFA'd and IDSPISPOPD'd uh, and ran through all the uh, levels, got to know them before I discovered them in the way they should have done. <laughs> and I don't know, I just punctured a lot of the, the the beautiful game design that was in there that I actually sort of properly dis- rediscovered when I sort of started playing it again in kind of more recent years and uh there's that i was also going to say that um i was interested you, you brought up Sama because i remember that graham asked me at the time like how do how do i play shmups and like i am not a good shmup player i'm not an experienced shmup player i enjoy them and um and there's something that i the, the way that i've discovered works for me best is not to continue um to use the number of you know the number of lives that the game just gives you um hmm. makes the games work for me much better because you just there's a point at which the intensity of the game is such that you're just throwing lives away and you lose the connection with what's happening and lose the the thrill of it fundamentally and you're not actually learning the game because you're just mashing your head up against constant restarts kind of deep into level four or five um the way i've been playing machine Sama is to only play um single credits and when i die don't continue start again from the start and through that i've grown to learn levels one and two so that i can get through them without dying if I'm playing well anyway, I know them well enough at any rate. All I've got to do is actually get good hands and eye coordination. But um, that's something that kind of, there are definitely some shooters that I have ruined for myself because I lost the meaning in them because I was restarting and, you know, level mm-hmm. life after life after life was just going by and I didn't enjoy them. And um, yeah, I've, I wondered how, how, how were you playing Mishim Summer? I mean, because I'm not criticizing anyone that would go through at all. It just doesn't really work for me. I kind of lose the thread. Uh, so I've been playing it where it just, I just, it gives you the continue countdown and I just can't not keep going, <laughs> yeah. taking whatever life it gives me. Because I just kind of want to see the, the new weird creatures. I yeah, think yeah. Um, with those cave shmups, I think they're all about, I don't know, half an hour long, perhaps, if you go through all of it in, in one go. I guess the, yeah. uh, uh, so I like to see it all, but now when I go back to it, I will actually start learning the levels because the, the, there's, with those games in particular, so it feels like when you start limiting those, the life pool, you start having to learn enemy attack patterns and when they appear on the screen where you need to be and that kind of stuff. And also like which of the weapon formations, things that you, you have that you prefer using, uh, then you actually sort of have to start learning the game, I suppose. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Look, look at your pictures <laughs> and be like, Ooh. Yeah, exactly. And um, I think that um, I think there's a sort of I think there's obviously a point where, you know, if you're good at you, know, you became you become insanely after a while, you become insanely good at level one. And like a lot of 
a lot of um, modern or modern kind of conversions of shmups like have some sort of tool that allows you to to dip directly. I think actually from Mushim Sama it doesn't come packed in or does it? Oh, I think they might be actually. I think they, it's a know, often mode. Yeah. Mo- they have mods and things that allow you to, to go straight to a certain level. Yeah. And, you know, or you have save states where you can go to that one point and then just do rote learning, which sounds kind of on it, the face of it really boring, but actually these lo- these games are just so densely interesting where like Mushima Sama, like there are so many layers of things to learn. Like first, it's just how you deal with the bullets. And then it's about, um, there's a certain ways that you shoot that yeah. are more effective than others. There's a certain pulsing way that you do it. And there's a kind of like a, there's an auto fire, but there's also like a single fire thing. And there's a, there's a surprising amount of nuance in, in the way that you actually fire. Then you realize that there, as, as Tom was saying earlier on, there are certain enemies that when you destroy them, um, bullets will disappear off the screen. And so when you know which ones they are, you can control the number of bullets on the screen. Then you've got to learn like positioning and that kind of thing where you're dominating the screen rather than um, sort of reacting to what's happening. And like, yeah. that means knowing where the enemies are going to come in, that you've got to focus fire on because they're going to dominate you otherwise uh, because their bullets are going to start sort of com- you know f- shepherding you into areas that you shouldn't really be putting you on the back foot like yeah layer upon layer upon layer like they're just I, i've never read anything about the game designers about about what they do and mm. there must be a, some material out there that goes deep into what they're thinking about because on the surface a lot of the cave shooters they're kind of just like you've got these similar looking patterns like of enemies that swoop in from the left and then from the right and then from the left and then from the right and then you've got some and you know from the middle and then they come down actually there's there's the real artistry in designing those those waves (laughs) and and how that do it done i don't know how done no it's, it's so deliberate and i think um so there are certain like attack patterns in this game where they're almost like streamers that are kind of controlled, like you can't really go across them and they kind of carve up the screen in shapes that you're kind of having to fight within for a little bit until the stream, yeah. the laser stops and then you have to kind of escape. Uh, it, it's just like, there's a, it's such an interesting kind of like, suppose you're being trapped and shifted into places that feel really uncomfortable. Like you just yeah. know this is really dangerous and there's not much room to maneuver and then figuring out the levels lets you avoid that beforehand hopefully and not get into a position where you're definitely going to lose a life uh it's, there's so much to them uh and that, i think that makes them sound super daunting i think they kind of are if you engage with them on it like oh just gonna do it all in one life to get a high score type thing but you can bash through them as well um oh, yeah and- you can bash through them or you can say hey uh I, my project is just to get good at level one yeah and yeah. so you get level, you level one and then maybe Maybe you'll try out level two next. Yeah. And like chop it up into pieces. I mean, that's another thing that I learned that works better for me. Hmm. Hmm. In terms of ruining games for myself, uh, I've done this with mods. Uh, <laughs> part of it. Actually, uh, and I, I think the most ruinous version of this I experienced was actually like happened with Skyrim and Oblivion to an extent, <laughs> where. It wasn't so much the mods I was installing. So I was, I was trying to get, you know, better rock textures, whatever, create a more kind of immersive experience, fix the UI. UI mods for Skyrim are excellent. Um, but the game became finessing my mod pool. <laughs> and I would play the game and I'd be like, oh, that's not quite right, right. Or that doesn't seem to have installed properly. Or is this supposed to be working this way? Or <laughs> uh, And and suddenly, and I would stop and I'd go back into the mods to see if there are any conflicts. And I spent more time doing that and then looking for new mods that that became the game entirely. <laughs> I realized that I wasn't actually playing Skyrim anymore. I was playing little 10 minute bursts to look for stuff mods were doing <laughs> or yeah. weren't doing that needed or gaps that needed to be filled. And uh, at that point, I realized that uh, whatever kind of kernel of respect I had for the world as a, as a place, as a kind of, you know, <laughs> as a, an, a, the illusion of that, that of going on an adventure with a, uh, with a hammer and hitting goblins was, was gone. <laughs> it, it was instead of kind of like, I was just sort of gardening and, you know, pruning bits of it. 
Um, it's funny because yeah. we're doing that is actually enjoying disengaged it. eye. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and um, to no effect, <laughs> it became a completely pointless waste of time because uh, I was trying to prove something that I was no longer interested, or able to invest in because of the act of tinkering with it. Um, and I find that with a lot of lot of mods and a lot of cheat codes can do that as well. Like, uh, so taking all of the enemies out of levels. And suddenly you're just kind of, sometimes it can work great. I think people have done this with them, um, horror games and uh, found the, where the world building is so strong that you're able to just make all the enemies dormant and get a really good experience out of it. Um, but yeah, for, for the most yeah. part, it, it, once you take out that stuff, suddenly what you're seeing is a kind of an empty film set. <laughs> and it's like all the, all the cameras, and all the lighting, people have gone home, all the makeup artists and all the actors have gone home. And you're just sort of like standing here in this kind of completely, completely artificial space, and uh, wondering what on earth you're what, what, what you doing there. Uh, so it's <laughs> quite easy to shatter the illusion, I think. <laughs> oh, it's like these games were designed intent with intentions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Maybe we weren't supposed to meddle. <laughs> yeah, man was not supposed to meddle. Well. I think that's all we've got time for uh, this evening. Um, so, like, yeah, like I said uh, earlier, if you do have any ideas for um, for audience participation, um, let us know. Um, you can send it to uh, our. Um, we can actually um, questions at creightoncrowbar dot com. You can put it there because that will just pop up in the very place that we're thinking about it. Um, you can hang out with us and our community on our Discord channel. Maybe you can discuss it there. Um, uh, you can find the link for our Discord channel on our website at creightoncrowbar.com. If you have a question for a future episode, uh, send it to us. <laughs> to create, create, create. I'm reading off a sheet and I've just <laughs> confounded myself. So blah, 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 blah. Uh, we're on, on <laughs> uh, Twitter at uh, Creighton Crowbar. Uh, you can also listen to the show on, on YouTube. We'll also find uh, various spin-offs um, and bits and pieces uh, that we do, including Ministers Monthly. Um, uh, that's at uh, YouTube slash Creighton Crowbar. Um, Creighton Crowbar is kindly funded by our Patreon backers. If you'd like to know more about supporting our podcast and its spin-offs, uh, visit us at uh, patreon.com slash, you guessed it, Creighton Crowbar. That's all the stuff. I've been Alex Wiltshire. I've been Top Senior. Thanks, Thanks for listening, for listening everybody. everybody.